hepatogenesis of HC, NASH, and so on. In particular, today's moderator, Professor Sarin, is the first to clinically adopted the relationship between microbiota and the fecal transplantation and the liver disease in Asia. So I am looking forward to today's webinar. I will introduce today's webinar's moderator. As you well know, Professor Sarin is the senior professor, hepatology and the director, Institute of Liver and the Biliary Science, ILBS, New Delhi. He's setting up the ILBS on the government of Delhi, and he is also the director, WHO Coral Death Center in Chronic Liver Disease and Biohepatitis at ILBS. He has more than 600 publications to his credit, 80 to 13 books on liver disease, and to contribute uh, 87 chapters in various medical textbooks. He helped develop 19 major guidelines and the chairman of a steering committee of APASL and the ATA of Hepatology International. And he got many awards. And I introduced the second moderator, Jasmine Bajas. He graduated the Wisconsin Medical College now he has a professor of Virginia Commonwealth Medical University, USA. His concern about serious microbiota and the hepatic encephalopathy. Also, he published many papers about microbiota and the serious. So, Professor Sarin, please. Uh, thank you, President uh, Jin Mo Yang. Uh, from Korea, and I must compliment you and your team for having set up this very nice uh, program and having invited me and Professor Bajaj to uh, moderate this session. Uh, we are very lucky that Apostle has, uh, and the workers in Apostle have contributed to this area. Uh, the philosophy of using microbiota in different liver diseases is not new. It actually started from uh, China and maybe Japan early enough. So now what we are doing is using these techniques in our patients. Uh, at ILBS, we have a fecal microbial transplant unit where we do uh, almost regularly FMT in different groups of patients. Uh, one of our lead workers is also a speaker today, Dr. Shastri, who has uh, joined us. We have an uh, excellent team of uh, uh, speakers and, and uh, a very excellent team of panelists today. I would uh, uh, also like to say that we are privileged to have Professor Bajaj, Jasmine Bajaj, with us, who has uh, done stellar work in the patients with uh, FMT. I am not seeing uh, Dr. Bern Schnabel. Is uh, uh, Professor Bern Schnabel online somewhere? If you're on, can you please switch on your... He's pre-recorded. Uh, it's it's 3 a.m. Uh, it's pre-recorded. Right yeah, it's 3 a.m. Uh, okay. in California uh, right now. <laughs> all right. So with that, uh, maybe uh, we would have the first presentation on gut liver access modulation in alcoholic liver disease by... Professor Bernd Schnabel, most of us know that yes, we have video. Yeah. He has, he has um, both experimental as well as clinical work related. Hello, I am Bernd Schnabel and I'm a professor of medicine and director of the San Diego Digestive Diseases Research Center at the University of California in San Diego. I would like to thank the organizers, the Asia Pacific Association for the Study of Liver and especially Professor Jung Suk Lim for inviting me to talk about gut liver access modulation in alcoholic liver disease. These are my disclosures. And this is the overview. I would initially introduce the gut microbiome and the alcohol-associated liver disease. I want to then talk about changes that occur in the gut microbiota composition 
in alcohol associated liver disease. I want to then switch over and tell you about the contribution of the gut microbiota to alcohol associated liver disease. And finally, we want to highlight some precision approaches to restore host microbiome homeostasis to treat liver disease. As you know, if somebody drinks chronically alcohol, the patient will eventually end up with hepatic steatosis. However, the minority of the patient will advance to more progressive liver disease, including steatohepatitis, fibrosis, or cirrhosis. We have one special entity which arises predominantly in patients with an underlying cirrhosis and which is called alcoholic hepatitis. Alcoholic hepatitis still has a very high 90-day mortality and there is currently no effective therapy available. The number of liver transplantations for alcohol-associated liver disease is rising, and the number of liver transplants for alcoholic hepatitis is also increasing, especially over the last several years. The human gut microbiota consists not only out of bacteria, but we have also fungi and we have viruses present. Especially the viral microbiota has the largest number of microbes in the gut. We have about the same number of human cells as we have microbial cells in our body. However, if we look at the gene numbers, the microbial genes outnumber the human genes that are present in our body. So the question is, does the gut microbiota contribute to alcohol associated liver disease? And we know from a landmark study published by Gabriel Perlmutter in Paris in 2016, he transplanted stool from alcoholic hepatitis patients into germ-free mice, and then he fed these knotobiotic mice chronically alcohol. And as you can see here, these mice transplanted with stool from alcoholic hepatitis patients had the highest liver injury and hepatic steatosis as compared to the mice that had the conventional microbiome after alcohol feeding, so suggesting that alcohol-associated liver disease is transmissible in mice. Does the gut virome change in patients with alcohol-associated liver disease? And we have recently published this study. And in this study, we isolated viral particles from patients with alcoholic hepatitis, patients with alcohol use disorder, and from non-alcoholic controls. And as you can see, the virum consists predominantly out of bacteriophages. Now, the most significant change that we found between alcoholic hepatitis patients and alcohol use disorder patients or non-alcoholic controls was the significant increase in mammalian viruses. If you just look at the composition of the virome, each patient is presented in one column. You can clearly see that the composition of the virome in patients with alcoholic hepatitis is different from alcohol use disorder patients and from control patients. If we look at the viral diversity, we found that the viral diversity was highest in patients with alcoholic hepatitis and lower in alcohol use disorder patients and lowest in control patients. Focusing more on the mammalian viruses, we found that parvoviridae were significantly increased in patients with alcoholic hepatitis and alcohol use disorder patients as compared with non-alcoholic controls. In addition, we found a significant increase in herpesviridae, especially Epstein-Barr virus, in patients with alcoholic hepatitis, and we did not detect this in the stool from alcohol use disorder patients and non-alcoholic controls. When we looked at the MELT score in patients where we detected herpesviridae, this subgroup had a significantly higher MELT score as compared to the subgroup of patients where we did not detect herpesviridae in the stool. Switching over now to the fungi, 
And the question I want to answer is, does the gut fungal microbiome change in patients with alcohol-associated liver disease? In one of the earlier studies that we did, and this is an example from a mouse model, where we chronically fed either a isocaloric diet or an ethanol-containing diet for eight weeks. And we simply plated the feces on YPD agar plates and then um, assessed fungal colonies. And as you can see, in the control mice, there were hardly any fungal colonies detectable, while ethanol, chronic ethanol feeding resulted in a significant increase in fungal colonies. We saw similarly in patients with alcoholic hepatitis a significant increase in fungal colonies when we cultured feces from these patients as compared with the alcohol use disorder patients and as compared with the non-alcoholic controls. We also did qPCR from single colonies using specific primers for Canada albicans. And you can also see that in patients with alcoholic hepatitis, there was a significant increase in Canada albicans. We also used culture-independent techniques, in this case, ITS sequencing, to characterize the fungal composition in the stool from control subjects, patients with alcohol use disorder, and patients with alcoholic hepatitis. You can see that in the control subjects, one quarter about was Canada, shown here in red color. And then Canada essentially takes over in patients with alcohol use disorder and in patients with alcoholic hepatitis. When we look at the beta diversity, we could not discriminate patients with alcoholic hepatitis or alcohol use disorder, while they were clearly distinct from non-alcoholic controls. Furthermore, the fungal diversity was highest in the control patients as compared with patients with alcohol use disorder or patients with alcoholic hepatitis. So these studies suggest that the fungal composition in the gut microbiome is more or less driven by chronic alcohol abuse, but is less dependent on the liver disease stage. So the question is, how does the gut microbiome contribute to alcohol-associated liver disease? And I will just summarize many of the findings from the last um, several years. And this is a review we published also recently. You can see on top the intestine with the gut lumen, and then the intestine, as you know, is connected via the portal vein to the liver. So all the venous blood is drained via the portal vein to the liver. So whatever microbial molecules, metabolites, or other products are leaving the gut, the liver is really the first organ in our body to encounter all of these molecules. So what we learned over time is that pathogen-associated molecular patterns like lipopolysaccharide or LPS, but also beta-glucan from fungi, they can contribute to the progression of alcohol-associated liver disease. We also have learned that not only microbial products, but also live bacteria can translocate from the gut lumen to the liver and can contribute to alcohol-associated liver disease. We also know that indoles are decreased. They are very important tryptophan metabolites, and these are produced by the gut microbiota, and they are very important to induce, for example, antimicrobial activity in the intestine. Furthermore, we know that very important mediators of alcohol-associated liver disease are um, changes in the bile acids composition, but also in the amount of bile acids. Furthermore, we also have learned that short-chain fatty acids, for example, butyrate, are decreased, and that might also contribute to the progression of alcohol-associated liver disease. So in the following, I would like to highlight one of our own studies where we have shown how the gut microbiome, and especially bacteria, contribute to alcohol-associated liver disease and alcoholic hepatitis. In this case, we used culture-independent 16S rRNA sequencing and described the bacterial microbiome in non-alcoholic controls, alcohol use disorder patients, 
and achoric hepatitis patients. You can see, again, beta diversity is distinct between the controls between alcohol use disorder and between the alcoholic hepatitis patients. Bacterial diversity decreases from non-alcoholic controls to patients with alcohol use disorder and further decreases in patients with alcoholic hepatitis. One of the most prominent changes that we found was a significant increase in Enterococcus faecalis in patients with alcoholic hepatitis. And these were about two to three thousand fold higher in the alcoholic hepatitis patients as compared with the non-alcoholic controls. However, when we did correlation analysis between the total amount or relative abundance of Enterococcus faecalis with disease outcome and disease severity, we did not find any significant correlation. However, we found one toxin that is specifically produced by Enterococcus faecalis, which is called cytolysin. And we found that about 30% of the patients with alcoholic hepatitis are cytolysin positive in the stool. We did not find in cytolysin positivity in control subjects, and we only found one patient with alcohol use disorder to be cytolysin positive. When we further analyzed the survival in patients with alcoholic hepatitis, you can clearly see that the patients with cytolysin negativity had a very good survival, while about 90% of the patients with cytolysin positive stool that died within 180 days. So very strong biomarker to indicate a worse outcome and high mortality in patients with alcoholic hepatitis. In the last part of my talk, I would like to focus on precision approaches and how they can be used to restore host microbiome homeostasis to improve liver disease. So in the following, I would like to give you some examples how we can use the gut microbiome as a target for therapy to improve alcohol-associated liver disease. And the first example is that we can use bugs as drugs. So we can either use fetal microbiota transplantation to completely exchange the gut microbiota. We can use beneficial bacteria like probiotics. We can use prebiotics or symbiotics to add beneficial bacteria to an otherwise dysbiotic microbiota or we can use engineered bacteria to add to a patient's microbiota to, to produce beneficial products or to eliminate and metabolize toxins. I would like to provide some evidence that FMT is beneficial for patients with alcoholic hepatitis. In this case, a very small study coming out from India showed that fetal microbiota transplantation in steroid inelectable patients with alcoholic hepatitis shows survival benefit. These patients were treated for eight days with a daily FMT via a nasoduodenal tube. And the FMT group showed a much better survival as compared to a historical control group. This obviously needs to be repeated and further better controlled. And um, this is a very small trial, so more patients need to be included. We know that FMT has also side effects, and one of these side effects was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, where drug-resistant E. coli were transmitted via fecal microbiota transplantation. Another concept that I would highlight, we can essentially drug the bug. And in this case, what can be done is we can either use, for example, antibiotics or antifungates that we eradicate broadly um, bacteria or um, fungi. On the other hand, we can use bacteriophages to selectively target now some of these bacteria and to specifically eliminate them. In the following, I would like to give an introduction how bacteriophages work. The basic structure consists of a head, a sheath, and tail fibers. The tail fibers are what mediate attachment to the bacterial cell. The DNA stored in the head will then travel down the sheath and be injected inside the cell. 
Once inside the cell, the phage will hijack the cellular machinery to make many copies of itself. And lastly, the newly assembled phages burst forth from the bacterium, which resets their phage life cycle and kills the bacterium in the process. And this is the most important part that these phages are amplified inside the bacteria. Once they're released, their progeny can now affect new bacteria and the process starts from the beginning. And we have used this now in a mouse model of alcohol associated liver disease. So what we did is we used germ-free mice and we colonized them with feces from cytolysin positive alcoholic hepatitis patients. And then we treat this chlorobiotic mice with either a control bacteriophage or with a bacteriophage that specifically recognizes the cytolysin positive Enterococcus faecalis. And then we subjected these mice to chronic ethanol feeding. And as you can see here, we, the mice that are treated with the bacteriophages against the cytolysin positive Enterococcus faecalis, they have less liver injury as compared with the control bacteriophage treated mice after chronic ethanol feeding, and they have also less liver disease. So suggesting that phage therapy targeting the cytolysin positive Enterococcus faecalis reduces ethanol-induced liver disease in this humanized mouse model. Finally, in this last concept I would like to highlight, we can also use drugs from bugs. So bacteria make very beneficial metabolites. For example, they can modify uh, bile acids. They can also produce short-chain fatty acids. And these metabolites and products can be used to improve liver disease. So this is my key takeaway slide. Alcohol-associated liver disease is accompanied by changes in the gut microbiota. Intestinal microbiota contributes to alcohol-associated liver disease. And hopefully I've been able to convince you that intestinal dysbiosis represents an attractive target for therapy, but this needs to be personalized and requires precision approaches. Finally, I would like to highlight and advertise for our Gordon Research Conference on alcohol-induced end organ damage, which will be held in person between October 24th and October 29th this year in Ventura, California. This is between Malibu and uh, Santa Barbara. I am organizing this together with Dr. Sabo, and we have secured um, Dr. Bruce Beutler as keynote speaker. He's a Nobel laureate to, uh, in, from 2011. He discovered Tolac Receptor 4. I would like to thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Schnabel, for that excellent talk. We already are getting a lot of questions that are in the chat. If you do have more questions, please put it in the chat as well. Um, and, and, uh, the question and answer session will be at the end. I'm uh, very happy to uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Wang Pio Ko, who is a professor of medicine at uh, Seoul National University, who has published extensively in uh, NAFLD and NASH, as well as microbiome. Um, he has a, a stellar record of, uh, uh, you know, service and training as well in Seoul, as well as Harvard and UNC Chapel Hill. And he's currently in the Division of uh, Environmental um, uh, Health Sciences. He's going to talk to us about microbiota and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. On a related note, I would like to thank the organizers for giving this opportunity for us to moderate what is a very stellar session here. And uh, with my co-moderator, Dr. Sareen, whom everyone respects, I think this is uh, turning out to be a very nice educational opportunity and an interactive opportunity. So please send your uh, comments uh, and your questions via chat. Thank you. Dr. Ko, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bazai. Um, it's uh, very nice to, nice introductions. And I'd like to share my uh, slide first. I hope you see uh, my slide quite well. 
So um, uh, my name is uh, Kwang Kyoko at Seoul National University. And uh, there is something I need to disclose. So I've been working on microbiota for a number of years. I've been trained as microbiologist for the past uh, 30 years. And for many disease was affected by both uh, our own genetics and the environmental factors, including the uh, gut microbiota. So, uh, so um, the disease is something like nephrity is a chronic disease is more of significantly affected by uh, chronic exposure to the uh, environmental factors, uh, such as the uh, gut microbiota. So uh, as you know, uh, fat liver disease is caused by uh, either excessive alcohol intake or the metabolic disorders. And I would like to share uh, two studies uh, with you for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, that was uh, recently published from uh, my lab. The first study is uh, <clears throat> using the Korean, the uh, NAFRID cohort. Uh, collaborating with uh, Professor Wang Kim at uh, SNU uh, Brahmi Hospitals. So we analyzed over 200 subjects uh, on this, the uh, Korean nephrodic cohort, uh, which was the uh, very precisely diagnosed with the biopsies. And when you analyze the, uh, the microbiomes, we found out that the microbial community changes uh, according to the fibrosis severity are quite different uh, between not obese and obese and every subject. When you look at this, they all the population or together, uh, we couldn't find any special the, uh, the patterns. Uh, and also we couldn't find any uh, significant association in obese population. But uh, we found that there is a significant association with uh, gum microbiota and non obese population. And also, when you analyze the, uh, uh, the stool metabolites, uh, such as the uh, bile acid and the uh, short chain fatty acid, and number of different metabolites from the stool, and we found that non obese subjects were uh, also different patterns and significant associated with number of these the stool metabolites uh, with this nephrid uh, disease. And uh, particularly, the luminal caucasus and varial analysis showed significant interaction. Uh, with bile acid uh, and uh, in both population. When you look at this more specifically uh, on these, the, uh, the particular the, uh, families of these gut microbiota, uh, varial analysis were uh, positive associated with the uh, increased the fibrosis levels. And uh, on the other hand, luminal caucasus were negatively associated with, in particular among only non-obese population with the difference, the uh, criteria without the cirrhosis subject or the uh, uh, with non FVD subject, only the uh, severe fibrosis, uh, the, this patterns was quite uh, similar. And also uh, we uh, analyzed the uh, specific bile acid uh, with the same categories uh, this is the first three is non-obese uh, with the fibrosis levels in obese population with fibrosis levels. We see a uh, particular the bile acid such as choleic acid and chemodeoxycholic acid what is positive associated with uh, this one. And some of the short chain fatty acid, uh, particularly the propionate was significant associated with this, uh, the different fibrosis levels. So we have this the uh, gut uh, microbiome the uh, profile used at the uh, the sixteen s ribosome uh, RNA uh, sequencing and the stool metabolite. We uh, the, we believe that combination of the uh, these the gut microbiome markers and become metabolite diagnose significant fibrosis with uh, it AUC of the 0.939 in non obese subject. And uh, the, the other, the obese subjects was AUC was uh, 0.520. And also uh, we uh, performed this, some of these the subject with the whole, uh, whole genome shotgun sequencing. And uh, about the 38, the non-obese subject to confirm our, the, uh, the, 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 those the, uh, data. 
Japan, we found out the uh, BSH and BICD genes, which is to relate to the bile acid metabolism of the particular strain were identified. Uh, and uh, this was the significantly uh, downregulated in non-obese subjects with significant fibrosis. So since our study was done with the, uh, the Korean the, uh, the cohort, so we want to confirm that the different population, Western population, uh, we, uh, is this the consistent uh, with our research or not? So uh, in this case, uh, in Western NAFD cohort, we, uh, we download from the public database. And uh, in conclusion, we find the similar patterns uh, in the Western uh, Nephrid cohort population. And also, uh, when you identify these, the, uh, from the Hojan Shakon sequence, some of the uh, microbial species were, were uh, improving the uh, Nephrid disease. So, whether this is only just co occurrence or the uh, causality, so we uh, vigorously screened uh, these our the, uh, libraries, and then we identify luminal cohort faces, and then we did the uh, the mouse experiment whether this is the causal effect or not, uh, and the administration of this uh, particular strain uh, shows the uh, improvement of the ALT and ASG levels, and uh, and also, and uh, in in this case the MCD diet models, and we uh, also the uh, to confirm these the different two different mice models, CDA HFD models and DVDB models, uh, we confirm that the elevating effect of the luminal cocos feces on diet induced liver damage in uh, three different FD models, and uh, and also we believe this the particular the, the gene uh, related to this uh, family is related to the uh, different the stool metabolite, which is the uh, one of the uh, very close uh, association with the uh, NAFDBGs. And I want to move on to the second study of, of our, uh, the, 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 in this the, the talk. And a number of years ago, uh, we uh, published the, the, uh, the, the particular strain of the gut microbiota between the happy and uh, the metabolic syndrome groups. Our the group has been investigating the, the effect of microbiota using the Korean twin cohort, which is over 3,000 the uh, Korean twin population in Korea. So the advantage of using the twin is we can adjust for the human genetic factors, and then we try we can see the the effect of the uh, specific gut microbiota on the particular disease of our interest. In this case, we analyzed 655 a subject. And then we identify this uh, number of the, uh, the particular the, uh, bacteria, the species with the metabolic syndrome. This is uh, the data with the adjustment of the human genetic factors. Uh, particularly the echomantia we identify in this study were confirmed by many other groups. Uh, when he uh, published that uh, papers, uh, the Ruth Lay, uh, he is at the uh, uh, Max Planck Institute right now, at the time, the Cornell University. Uh, using this uh, uh, UK twin cohort, they published the very similar data. So in, in uh, over conclusion, the echomantia mucinifila is the, has a beneficial effect on the metabolic uh, disease. So our question was how this echomantia mucinifila can the effect on this metabolic disease. So we are uh, we have we isolate uh, four different strains of recommendation mucinifila from the healthy stool, and then uh, we found out the uh, we uh, basically did uh, uh, confirm this the administration of the recommendation mucinifila induced weight loss and regulated uh, the glucose homeostasis in this the uh, mice model, and also the recommendation mucinifila. Uh, can the, uh, the modulate the brown activation. So in this case, these uh, in histologies and uh, IBS cells or number of cells and specific, the IBS specific gene expression uh, has been uh, changed after the administration of echomation mucinifila. At the same time, 
uh, it changed the body temperature on that uh, body temperatures, a slightly increase of the uh, the body temperatures and the M2 macrophages. And also we found that the acclimation mission filler uh, induced the GLP-1 the expression. So administration of these the particular uh, the, 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 the microbial the species that increased the uh, GLP-1 increase we find. And uh, we our the uh, question was what is the molecular mechanism uh, to show that uh, specific the effect. So we uh, did the cell-free uh, spinatant. We, we break down the cells and trying to identify the particular the, uh, the fraction to induce the GLP-1 secretion uh, in the, uh, from the acclimation machine filler. And when you compare to the others, the uh, is known for this the, uh, beneficial effect, we uh, identify a particular fraction of the uh, acclimation machine filler that dramatically increase the GLP-1 secretion uh, in this case. We're trying to uh, the find the, the, the responsible for this the increase of the GLP-1 secretion. So we did the uh, acclimation with fillers. Uh, we uh, we, we uh, separate the pellet and uh, culture spinatant, and then we identify the fraction of through these the FPSCs and uh, and SMS mass. Uh, we then trying to identify the uh, particular the the molecules, and then uh, we particular genes we uh, clone to the plasmid, then express the uh, in the E. coli systems, and then uh, we uh, we screen that, and then we identify uh, a P9 the protein uh, is significantly when you look at this y scale y axis uh, significantly increase the GLP one expression uh, in NCI HE716. And, and also a glutex cell line as well. So uh, after this identified the particular strain and we have to purify the P9 protein and then we did the same experiment in animal models. So when you did the animal model, when you uh, did the order, uh, daily order garbage or P9, uh, this the protein, we found the uh, same effect, actually the, the better effect uh, when you did the hyperdial models and then uh, the weight loss and, and also this the particular the, uh, fat uh, increase and uh, glucose, the homeostasis was improved. And also the uh, we found the uh, GLP-1 secretion uh, as well. And also a P9 induced thermogenic genes in a brown adipocyte. And also, we uh, found is the uh, UCP1 uh, was the uh, the expression was increased in this case. And uh, so we uh, find that the, the P9 uh, was the improved the glucose homeostasis and the uh, improved the uh, the, the uh, metabolic disease. And also, we uh, find the P9 reduced the liver steatosis. So. When you analyze in these hyperdial models, and this is uh, normal chow and hyperd and the effect is uh, with the P9 administration, uh, this improvement of the liver statuses. So uh, we try to uh, investigate further what is the molecular mechanism. So P9 would release from the commission which the filler, a commission which filler are uh, living near the mucus, uh, very close to the gut epithelium. So uh, the, what is the molecules uh, to recognize P9? So we uh, did the ligand uh, receptor capture uh, technique based on uh, for the triceps. We uh, identified the binding, the potential bindings so of the KTN1 and ICAM2. And when we did this uh, in, uh, in the gluten levels, and the, uh, we did the, uh, the, P9, the we, uh, administered P9 and increase of this uh, GLP-1 secretion, and we confirmed that ICAM2 was responsible for this the, uh, P9 interaction uh, because when you add the ICAM2 peptide, the, the inhibitions and the, it was uh, significantly reduced and also when it blocked by the uh, ICAM2 antibodies and uh, it's uh, reduced uh, by uh, GLP-1 secretion was reduced. So we uh, believe that the ICAM2 uh, is responsible to interact with the uh, P9 uh, secreted by the commercial mucinifilla. 
And also the expansion of ICAM2 was not induced by P9. So P9 was not increasing the ICAM2, but we uh, also find the IL-6 knockout mice was this reduced. And also we confirmed that P9, uh, it was the administer P9 can uh, slightly increase the IL-6 uh, as well. So P9 regulates the glucohomeostasis in IL-6 dependent uh, pathways. So when you did the, uh, uh, when the glucose meiosis we did, when it white types, uh, we see the improvement of glucose meiosis. But when IL-6 knockout mouse, uh, the, this, uh, this phenotype disappear. And also, uh, we observed the same result when you administered by the uh, Ecomation Mission in Philas, P9 increased the lactate temperatures and GLP1 secretion, and also uh, this through these IL-6 uh, dependent ways. So in this case, the plasma GLP-1, the white types when P9 is uh, increased, but the uh, IL-6 knockout mass disappears, and uh, we could not see the uh, the uh, lactate temperature increase uh, when it, when you did the IL-6 knockout mass. And uh, so P9 is interacting with the ICAM2, and we thought we want to further uh, analyze what, liquid, what is the uh, cell signaling related to these the, uh, phenotypes. And when you did the RNA6 uh, uh, the analysis, and we find out is some of these, uh, these the, uh, the cell uh, the pathways responsible to calcium ions and uh, response to cyclic AMPs, uh, levels increase. So uh, we uh, basically uh, conclude that P9 increased the calcium and craft attraction factors as signaling pathways. So when you uh, conform in a well lab, uh, in, when you use the NCI HE706 cells, uh, in, uh, the, the, the add of the P9, the protein to this cell, uh, increase the, the calcium level here and uh, also uh, to increase the uh, the the p the crab. So, <clears throat> in conclusion, uh, we believe this is the molecular mechanisms of the P9. Uh, so, a commission mission field lab uh, released the P9 that interact with the IAKM2, and uh, and then it's the uh, it the released the GLP1. And some is affecting the uh, the immune cells, increase the uh, release to IL six, and this the uh, and also the ICAM two interaction uh, increase the PLCs and calcium and the CRAP two factors uh, causing the uh, GLP one uh, increase and thermogenesis in uh, brown adipose tissues increased and body weight decrease and glucose homeostasis uh, was improved in order to improve the liver statuses. So uh, those two uh, recently, uh, our published paper uh, shows that uh, interaction be between these, the uh, obesity and the, uh, the nephrody and the NASH, and the, we believe is the uh, number of different factors, uh, including the, the human factors and the, uh, the, 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 the disease of phenotypes and the uh, role of the microbiota is very important to uh, causing these uh, the uh, liver disease. So I'd like to acknowledge my uh, the, the groups. Uh, the first the first study was done by Gil Lee, Lee uh, and the second study by the Hushin uh, Yun, uh, who is my uh, current and uh, former uh, doctoral student. And also I'd like to thank my the funding agencies and the uh, collaborators. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ko. This was a wonderful talk and going so deep into the mechanism of something that is troubling us day in and day out. Um, again, please put your questions in the chat. We will have a separate chat. Uh, uh, we'll have a separate session afterwards. Um, and now the next speaker is Dr. Shastri, who's an assistant professor at ILBS in New Delhi uh, since 2014. He is um, he did his training in Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College in Ajmer, Rajasthan, and then BM in Hepatology from LPS under Dr. Selim. He has special interest in alcoholic, uh, alcoholic liver disease, gut microbiome, and liver disorders, 
as well as uh, endoscopic procedures and management of emergencies. Uh, he's going to talk to us about fecal transplant in the disease. Dr. Shastri. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the kind uh, introduction. Yeah, it's my privilege to be part of this uh, session. And the uh, sessions are really awesome. And I'll, uh, I'll start my speak, speech on uh, fecal microbiota transplantation in liver diseases. I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, not going. Now, uh, liver disease uh, 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 is very well. Liver lives in very close intimacy with the gut, and uh, hence the diseases of the liver will affect the gut as well. So, dispose this biosis, which is uh, less of the good bacteria and the abundance of the bad bacteria, is a well-known thing. And uh, uh, liver diseases are known to cause the dysbiosis uh, by the by the virtue of its. Uh, portal hypertension, reduced uh, gastric acidity, impaired motility, local and uh, systemic uh, immunological dysfunctions, and the bile acid changes. Uh, the liver is known to cause changes in the gut microbiome. And uh, similarly, the, uh, it's, it's, it's also the other way. The changes in the gut microbiome also causes the pathogenesis of various uh, and most of the liver diseases, and its role is very crucial. Uh, who is first, the disbiosis is first, or the liver disease is first, it's very, sometimes very difficult to say. And uh, uh, dysbiosis itself will cause uh, intestinal oxidative stress, intestinal inflammation, leaky gut, and uh, uh, more uh, bacterial products in the circulation, cell activation, uh, inflammatory response, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. The modulation by the fecal microbiota transplantation by FMT will be a promising therapeutic and also maybe a preventive uh, option in the management of uh, uh, liver diseases by acting at various stages directly and as well as uh, indirectly. And uh, yeah, this is the outline. Uh, I'll start with the uh, uh, role of FMT. I'll, I'll be focusing mainly on the available clinical data on FMT in the liver diseases. And firstly, the alcoholic liver disease, uh, like uh, uh, as we know, uh, the the, good, the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium and dominococcus, they are the good ones. They are reduced in alcoholic liver disease. And, more, and the initial works and the most of the work in the dysbiosis or gut microbiome is mainly done on alcohol-associated liver diseases. And there is also overabundance of the bad ones here. And it has also been shown that some of the bacteria, some of the uh, bacteria are uh, their abundance uh, proportion uh, proportionately increases uh, with the severity of the alcoholic hepatitis, which is the most florid form. And uh, this is pictorial representation of the same. There is a uh, disruption of the tight uh, junctions. There is uh, dysbiosis with lower lactobacilli, leaky gut, in, uh, local inflammatory cells activation, and the liver inflammation. And uh, it has also been shown both in the mice and the human studies that the bacterial overgrowth of the dysbiosis in liver diseases, especially the alcohol ones, are more pronounced in the proximal bowel. And uh, as I said, the alcoholic hepatitis is the most florid form of the alcoholic uh, liver diseases. Uh, is very uh, is, is very much in discussion because of the lack of its uh, specific therapies available and only standard of care that steroid, which has only short-term survival benefit up to 28 days and the longer-term benefit uh, is not known. And even in those who receive steroids, the, there are a portion of patients who will not respond to steroids. And there is a larger chunk who are not eligible for steroid therapy to begin with. And additionally, uh, those who do not respond and those who are ineligible, they, most of them also do not have uh, transplant options because of the recent alcohol intake and other many social issues. So the, the treatment options are uh, very minimal in this group. And uh, as gut dysbiosis is the uh, core of the central uh, role in the pathogenesis of alcoholic liver diseases. So the modulation of this would definitely be the a very appropriate way of uh, tackling these patients and and, we are, uh, and to cover most of the patients, not just confined to the eligible or ineligible. So this paper was uh, discussed very well by the professor, professor Stabel. Uh, it's a very interesting and very intriguing. The alcoholic uh, hepatitis is transmissible. So the uh, gut microbiome from the uh, alcoholic hepatitis patients transferred or transplanted into the ethanol-fed mice, germ-free mice, produced liver injury 
produce liver injury with transaminases and increased fat content and again it was reduced by uh, the transplantation of the uh, microbiome from the stable alcohol patient into the uh, injured uh, mice and it it, it uh, re reduced it shows that the even uh, 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 the alcoholic hepatitis itself is transmissible and it is also curable by the good microbiome and uh, uh, we need both alcohol and intestinal gut microbiome to act synergistically to induce alcoholic liver disease and this was the uh, second uh, uh, very interesting study published in jf17 again uh, uh, mice group of mice were adapted from the same facility and to different two labs and one lab had alcohol sensitive mice and the other were alcohol resistant the injury did not happen with despite alcohol consumption and there it was found that the good bacteria like bacteroids were high in the alcohol resistant mice and whereas the sensitive mice had uh, more of a uh, more of the bad guys and uh, it produced more of inflammatory cells il1 ilt and other things so what they did further was Uh, it was uh, it came to be known that it's the microbiome that is reason for uh, the sensitivity of the alcohol what they did was they transplanted the gut microbiome from these mice the resistant mice into the sensitive mice and this fmt reduced the alt or the liver injury in the sensitive mice as well so uh, the fmt can cure alcoholic uh, liver injury that was the concept of this study and uh, based on this we uh, and uh, uh this is the only pilot study available human study on uh, uh, patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis this was i'm happy to be part of this study uh, and uh, what the our uh, like this group did uh, fmt fecal microbiome transplantation in patients who were not eligible for steroids uh, that means they were really sick to begin with uh, with very high mild of 31 and uh, fmt was given through naso duodenal tube on daily basis for uh, Mm, uh, for seven days, exact uh, technique. I'm not going into details because de constraints of the time. And eight patients that were compared with a retrospective uh, cohort of 18 uh, comparable cohort uh, with standard of therapy. And what was found was uh, there was a very uh, there was increase in the bacterials and decrease in the proteobacteria in the patients who received FMT. to come compared to baseline by uh, repeat sampling done at three months. And there was also increased relative. abundance of the bifo bacterium uh, clinically the survival was much better the 3 month 6 month survival was much better in the group which received fmt compared to the ret uh, retrospective co com comparable cohort so th this led us to think that why not uh, as steroids has only short term survival benefit why not try uh, fmt uh, head on head with steroids because it uh, it gives long term survival benefit this is a uh, this is a, again a study by apurva Uh, he 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 did the study by comparing steroids compared with the fecal microbiome transplantation head on head for seven days, and then uh, steroids were managed as per the protocol, what we standard we use standardly, and the FMT was given as we used in the previous study, you know, seven days daily for and then follow it up uh, for later, and this is unpublished data uh, which shows that the. Uh, I, uh, FMT is had better. Uh, this is the purple. Purple line is the FMT survival, which was much better than the steroid non-responders. And at par with the steroid responders till day 60. Beyond day 60, the survival was better than the steroid responders. And uh, the numbers were 90, 45 in each of the limb. And survival was uh, in FMT limb around 84, 84%. 90 day survival transplantary survival whereas it uh, it was 70% in the steroid responders so uh, the, the, these are encouraging results which uh, make us believe that the dysbiosis uh, can be cured and this can help in curing the, the most worried liver conditions like alcoholic hepatitis so where do i place the fmt in the current treatment algorithm of alcoholic hepatitis basically is uh, patients who are ineligible to steroids or not responding or who have continued Should higher mild beyond 20, beyond 30 days if mild is more than 14 or if the patient fulfills the criteria for transplant even after a month or two then also we can think of FMT uh, in such patient especially in those who do not have transplant options so uh, and uh, this is the only available data so far for alcoholic hepatitis and one more interesting data from the just uh, professor just by Josh group that this is with uh, this is the phase one trial double blind RCT uh, this is on the problem drinking with audit score of more than eight. And serotics, alcoholic serotics, number twenty, ten in each limb, uh, and the FMT limb received FMT enema single dose 
on day one and compared to uh, placebo enema in the control group. And what they saw was the alcohol craving questionnaire uh, showed decreased craving in the group which received the uh, uh, FMT compared to the uh, placebo uh, enema group. Uh, craving was reduced by 90% on, of, in the FMT group compared to only 30% in the placebo enema received group at day 15. And also there was reduction in the urinary ethyl glucuronide uh, levels. And the, uh, additionally, there was improved cognition and psychosocial sickness impact profile was decreased, was better in patients with the uh, uh, FMT group. So this is this, this sounds good that uh, uh, even the craving and the relapse and lapse can be prevented by using FMT in this group of patients. Uh, second set of diseases in liver disease is the second set of patients are the hepatic encephalopathy where we have a lot of data on uh, gut microbiome and the fecal microbiome transplantation, especially from the uh, Professor Bajaj group. And it is well known that the dysbiosis ratio, mainly the lactospirase, ruminococci, which produce the short chain fatty acids are drastically reduced in patients who uh, have end stage liver disease and uh, recurrent hepatic encephalopathy. And there is also overabundance of the uh, urease producing or ammonia generating organisms in the patients with end stage liver disease. These bacterial products and the uh, uh, like ammonia, mercaptans, and other things, in addition to the direct bacterial contents, the endotoxins and TNA, they directly uh, trigger the inflammatory response and uh, cause astrocyte swelling and the pathogenesis, they're the crucial role in the pathogenesis of the hepatic encephalopathy. Thus, FMT can be a promising tool in addition to the standard of care, which is lactose and rifaximin by modulating the gut microbiota in patients with hepatic encephalopathy. Let's see the data what we have right now. Uh, this was the first uh, case report published in 2016 on a, a ALD plus HCV 57 year old guy with persistent or recurrent grade one to HG. He was given four shots of uh, 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 fecal uh, FMT, first shot was through anyone, and the rest were, uh, first, first one was through colonoscope and remaining was through the retention enemas. And the patient had persistent lethargy, reversal of sleep and disorientation. His uh, performance improved post uh, FMT after 15 days and which, rem which uh, remained improved uh, till a uh, couple of months to come down with the improved reaction time on the stroop test, re reduction in the serum ammonia levels, improved quality of life. So uh, this was the first study which showed that FMT can uh, help in hepatic encephalopathy as well. Based on this, uh, Professor Bajaj et al. has published two uh, very nicely conducted trials. The first one was the open label RCT, where FMT plus standard of care, the lactulose and the uh, uh, rifampicin was uh, compared with the standard of care uh, without FMT. A single donor was used based on the uh, microbial richness uh, of the lactinosperiosity and ruminococcus A. Single dose of enema was given after the broad spectrum antibiotics of five days, and uh, they, they could see improvement in the cognitive tests, uh, PFS and the stroop test. And additionally, there was long-term good impact over 12 to 15 months with uh, very low hospitalization rates and the total number of HE events were almost null at uh, one year follow-up, more than one year follow-up in patients who received uh, FMT. This was a very small pilot study, 10 patients only, but still it's a wonderful result. And the second study they did was the, again the safety trial pilot study, phase one study. Uh, in this, they used the capsules containing this uh, enriched uh, bacteria, uh, mainly FMT, uh, 15 capsules were given uh, in patients with, uh, again, recurrent HE, uh, uh, and the number of HE episodes and hospitalizations or emergency visits were reduced drastically in patients who received uh, FMT capsules compared to the uh, controls. Additionally, they could also see the reduction in the inflammatory markers like interleukin-6, in, in improvement in the gut microbial uh, antimicrobial protein. Uh, they have done repeat biopsies, journal and support biopsies in the patients who received capsules after uh, three months. And uh, there was improvement in the antimicrobial proteins and reduction in the serum uh, LPS binding proteins in these groups. And uh, definitely there was also improvement in the uh, cognition uh, response uh, in these patients. So there are many more trials in the uh, ongoing uh, trials registered in the uh, GOV and uh, various trials are mainly concerned uh, doing with the uh, capsule versus cinema, number of days of uh, installation, uh, uh, like uh, uh, dosing, especially lifeless capsule versus uh, frequency and the route of administration, enema versus gastroscopic and the long term.
management have been uh, steady and uh, it would be interesting to look at the results in coming days so the uh, next uh, uh, next presentation in liver disease would be the nafld one uh, the non alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease ones and the uh, definitely this is one of the diseases where the pathogenesis is centered around the gut and dysbiosis uh, it has been shown that the uh, butyric acid producing short chain fatty acid producing firmicutes are reduced in patients with a nafld and additionally there is overabundance of these bad guys with along with the mainly the uh, ethanol producing e coli and clefcil are enriched in these patients with nafld it is called auto brewery syndrome so the concept is uh, giving this magic pill for fmt will uh, uh, will decrease the chances of nfld progressing to nash nash progressing to cirrhosis by decreasing the gut inflammation or gut dysbiosis so what is the data we have on clinical side there are only two studies which are published so far the first one is a double blind both are double blind uh, randomized controlled trials uh, the allogenic fmt in 15 patients versus autologous fmt in six patients single endoscopic uh, fmt instilled into the duodenum uh, they wanted to look at the huma ir the insulin resistance and the, the liver fat through mr pdff after six months but there was no there, uh, there was a failure of the results here at the primary endpoint there was no change in the insulin resistance and as well as there was no decrease in the hepatic pdff fat content at six months but the interesting part was they could see significant changes of uh, in the small intestinal permeability to mannitol and lactitol mannitol the intestinal permeability was reduced after six weeks and uh, in the second study lean vegan allogenic donor was used single donor was used in 10 patients uh, compared with the autologous uh, fmt in the control group uh, in this they used uh, three times uh, at eight weekly interval 8 8 8 till 24 weeks they give fresh nasodiodinal samples and they, they did biopsy at baseline and after 24 weeks there was a trend towards the reduction in the necro inflammation on histology and follow up and along with the um, there is a reduction in the mean alt by minus 14 although it was not that significant there was a trend towards a significant reduction in the necro inflammation and alt levels uh, this is the only data available in nafld uh, many trials are undergoing which have planned like as many phase 1 phase 2 trials open label trials uh, they are planning to do pre and post biopsy biopsy proven nash patients uh and upper ga upper ga upper ga route most of them are using the upper ga route and uh, i'm sure the results will be uh, interesting to look at and coming to the another interesting area hepatitis b virus related and dysbiosis this is very interesting to know that uh, if with the hep- in, in patients with hepatitis b we all know that the immunology plays the major role the change in the immunology leads to the activation of the virus and viral clearance or the disease progression so there are various studies to show that the gut microbial changes are there in chronic hepatitis b patients and even in the mice there are uh, uh, i'll not going to i'll not read the bacterial names uh, but the interesting part is uh, with uh, uh, even in the hbv infected mice once the enterocavity is started or treatment is given i'm sorry yeah the dysbiosis uh, uh, reverses after the hbv infection treatment and in patients with hbv in addition the uh, only infection hepatitis or cirrhosis there is progressive reduction in the alpha diversity of the gut microbiome so uh, the gut microbiome uh, having main role in the immunolo- immunology it helps in the uh, activation of immune cells such as t cells reduction of the inflammation interleukins and other things so the, this this is known to have an effect on the hepatitis b there are a couple of studies in fact three studies uh, two studies uh, based on the uh, in patients who have been on long term antivirals e positive non serotics with persistent e positive status and it's uh, interesting to see that the e hb eag levels go down after the Uh, FMT single dose along with the antivirals of course uh, there is reduction in the HB EEG levels and the HB of uh, like uh, you can see four out of the five patients who received FMT uh, in with E positive status lost their E antigen uh, within uh, within forty within forty uh, weeks. Uh, that that is very interesting. There, but there is no HB SAG zero conversion. HB EEG decline and zero conversion was noted. <clears throat> In the, in the second study done from Ames Delhi, uh, they have also looked at the similar group of patients, E positive, uh, 14 patients. Uh, two out of 14 became uh, E negative with at one month and three months respectively after FMT from a single donor, single healthy donor. But these two patients had uh, DNA undetectable at the 
uh, at the start of treatment, but still they were E positive. And uh, these are very preliminary results, but they are definitely they are encouraging. And the third trial, this was done at our place. Our group, uh, like we included the sicker group of hepatitis B, HBV reactivation, the mean mild was 28. And uh, we did FMT daily for seven days uh, in, uh, versus, well, along with tenofovir versus tenofovir itself alone, 32 patients in each limb. The 90-day 90, 90 transplant-free survival in this group of HPV reactivation ACLF was significantly different, 75% versus 37.5% transplant-free survival. Along with that, there was a lesser incidence of infections, SBP and pneumonia in patients who received FMT compared to those who did not. And, and coming to the last part of the study, these are the interesting new roles for liver disease. I was, uh, these are the very interesting areas. Uh, recently published one single RCT on PSC in FMT, uh, FMT in PSC, in fact. Uh, it is well known that there is reduced the bacterial diversity and three bacterial genera, Enterococcus, Physobacterium, and Lactobacillus, they are over uh, abundant in patients with PSC, independent of the uh, fibrosis or IBD or UDCA use or a liver transplant. So this group uh, in 2019, they used, uh, included the patients with PSC and IBD. It was an open label pilot trial of 10 patients, single endoscopic FMT in the right colon, uh, single donor, no antibiotics use. There was reduction of uh, alkaline phosphatase by more than 50% in three out of the 10 patients. And, uh, and additionally, there was also an improvement in the bacterial diversity in one week. And additionally, what they could see was uh, the increase in the bacterial diversity correlated with the uh, reduction in the alkaline phosphatase levels. So the bacteria were actually responsible for the, those who had a response in bacterial diversity, they had reduction in the alkaline phosphatase. And this is the only study available and there is no studies available in the autoimmune hepatitis or PBC. <clears throat> and uh, coming to the transplantation, this is a, an interesting paper from Tokyo. This is in patients with uh, stem cell transplantations having acute graft versus host disease of the gut with bloody diarrhea and uh, uh, hematogesia, uh, uh, basically an acute uh, rejection, graft versus host disease. They gave FMT for uh, four uh, stem cell transplanted patients with acute graft versus host disease of the gut. And uh, out of them, uh, three were steroid resistant or one was steroid dependent. And uh, three, pa three patients showed complete response after the single dose of uh, uh, FMT. Uh, through the uh, the through the duodenum gastroduodenal tube, and one had partial response with reduction in the uh, diarrhea or bloody diarrhea levels and even the uh, engraftment. And they also could uh, look at the regulatory T cell uh, response to FMT in this particular group of patients. So possibly in our liver transplant as well, if the uh, if to reduce the rejections or maybe to in increase the acceptance, FMT might have a crucial role. And uh, uh, only data I could get hold on in liver transplant patients is this one. And it has been seen that after 21 days after liver transplant, uh, so there will be sudden increase in the diversity of the gut microbiome. With uh, uh, If you divide the, uh, between the groups who develop acute uh, cellular rejection and who do not, those who develop acute cellular rejection have these bacteria overgrown after third week, bifidobacteria, streptococci, enterobacteria, and bacteroids. In the non-ACR groups, the other ones like Romanococci, Costridia, these uh, families uh, go, uh, are, are they overgrow, they, have, they are outnumbered. So possibly uh, the, uh, the transplant draft acceptance and the rejection will depend on the gut microbiome as well. So, and, uh, and this is another simple case uh, report of a successful FMT on, in a patient of a post liver transplant patient who had severe complicated crossover repeated infection not responding to even vancomycin. They, uh, they have shown that FMT first dose given for rectum because it was very friable, next to oral capsules were used. There was a re a remission of the uh, clostridium dextral infection uh, even in post transplant patients who received FMT. And also uh, it was safe even in post transplant patients who received immunosuppression. So, there are definitely many hurdles for FMT and the uh, way ahead is not like it's a one size doesn't fit all. And uh, it is very difficult to find out the ideal donors. If the donor has a pro-inflammatory microbiota, the purpose will not be served. It is important to identify patient, uh, donors with 
uh, good anti-inflammatory uh, microbiota in them. And additionally, if the patient has a vaccine winning disease like, uh, like IBD with inter intermittent flares or HBV with reactive, the inactive disease timed uh, uh, gut samples or stool samples can be biobanded and used when the whenever there is a, a pro-inflammatory flares later. So banking of the autologous FMT can also be planned. So ideal route and frequency, it can also be, it, it, it is also not uh, universal that you know, this, it is, this route is good or this is bad. It should depend on indiv individual disease and situation based, which route should be used and uh, how frequently we need more data to decide how frequently and how long. And it should be customized and uh, tailored for individual uh, patients according to his own microbiome, uh, microbial signature. And uh, definitely the durability of the desired effect is very, import uh, very important to be assessed in the future studies. And uh, we should also be aware of the risks of unknown infections or donor phenotype, like uh, transfer transmitting obesity to a, a person who, is, who was lean before FMT because he just received FMT from an obese guy. Uh, we should also be open to uh, the unknown risks which can be associated with FMT. So to summarize, uh, uh, gut microbiota, is involved in the pathogenesis of many and most of the liver diseases. And uh, FMT is definitely a way to modulate the microbiota. Early but encouraging results in many liver diseases are available so far. And uh, definitely FMT is a palatable medicine now, at least more palatable. And uh, we need more good quality trials and uh, very well-conducted multicentric trials to prove or uh, make it better utilizable to and reachable to many patients who may definitely see better uh, life with uh, FMT. And uh, I would like to say thank you uh, for the organizing committee for having me here. And uh, thank you. Um. Thank you, Dr. Shastri, uh, for this comprehensive presentation. Uh, in the interest of time, we have many questions, but maybe we can have them in the discussion part uh, subsequently. And uh, I would take the opportunity of introducing my dear friend and respected friend, Dr. Robert Schraub, who has uh, spearheaded the area for a very long time. And uh, he is uh, an associate professor of medicine and also one of the pioneer workers in the field of uh, liver regeneration and of course, microbiota. And Robert would be speaking, I guess it is uh, early morning time for him with coffee. It's, uh, he will be speaking on the role of microbiota in hepatocarcinogenesis. Robert, over to you. If this is a video, we may start, but I think we have uh, Dr. Robert Schwabe also available. Yes, it, is it, it will be a may video. start the video. It will be a okay. video. Suddenly. My name is Robert Schwabe, and I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk today about the role of the microbiota in hepatocarcinogenesis. This is a rapidly growing field, a search of PubMed with the keywords cancer, micro, cancer and microbiome has shown that there's virtually no publications in the early 2000s, um, but we have now um, an exponentially growing field with thousands of papers per year. Whereas initial studies were focusing on specific pathogens associated with cancer development, especially bacteria such as H. pylori driving gastric cancer and malt lymphoma, the field has transitioned and evolved to study the commensal microbiota and dysbiosis in carcinogenesis and also in cancer therapy and starting out in colorectal cancer, this has expanded to virtually all tumors, shown uh, roles in of the microbiota in lung, breast, pancreatic cancer, and today's topic, liver cancer. The microbiota, I would like to 
emphasize that it's not just uh, bacteria. I'm not going to focus on this in today's talk, but there has been a role of the microbiome biome in cancer development shown in pancreatic cancer, as well as in tumor therapy. I'm going to talk about three topics today. Uh, what is the evidence for the role of the microbiome in liver cancer? What are the involved pathways? And is the microbiome a therapeutic target? This is going to be an overview of the topic uh, from multiple studies in the field. I'm going to weave in some of our uh, data also, but these are studies that are mostly a few years old. We have transitioned since then to other topics, which still involve uh, bacteria, but more as a therapeutic vehicle. So what is the evidence for the role of the microbiota in liver cancer? We know that there's dysbiosis throughout the disease progression from normal liver to different stages to HCC with dysbiosis and increased translocation for 20 to 30 years, driving, for example, in fatty liver disease, uh, and the energy nutrient extraction and also inflammation. A study from the group of Jeff Gordon elegantly showed the role of the obesity associated gut microbiome having an increased capacity for energy harvest. In addition, in later stages, the microbiome affects epithelial injury and stellate cell activation. We've shown a role for TLR4 in the microbiota in stellate cell activation of liver fibrosis. The same pathway is also ongoing in advanced stages of fibrosis and in the transition from cirrhosis to HCC, 90% of tumors develop in cirrhotic livers. Inflammation, epithelial proliferation, survival um, play roles, um, as well as an increasing role of the immune responses in the setting. And this is most. This is the most relevant setting as most tumors develop in these. Uh, patients with cirrhosis, and that's also going to be the main focus of the talk today. So most of the evidence comes from mice, especially functional studies, showing um, data from our 2012 cancer cell paper, where we first use uh, antibiotics, got sterilized mice by quadruple, a quadruple antibiotic cocktail, which was highly efficient at reducing the bacteria, and in a uh, carcinogen-driven model, we could see a strong uh, reduction of HCC development seen by multiple parameters in the group that received the antibiotics. However, to exclude that these antibiotics can directly affect the tumors rather than the microbiome only, although most of these are non-absorbable, we also uh, studied germ free mice. And to make a long story short, we saw a similar, very profound reduction of cancer development in germ free mice. Similar results have been obtained by other groups and in other models. Here an example from the group of A.G. Hara using a high-fat diet model of HCC where they first inject a carcinogen followed by high-fat diet and this leads to profound tumors which could be strongly reduced by antibiotics, either a quadruple cocktail similar to ours or vancomycin alone. And then finally, um, another example, more recent example, uh, from the group of Vijay Kumar, where they used uh, dysbiotic mice that were um, fed a diet high in fermentable fiber and the metabolites from the uh, microbiota uh, drove uh, the development of liver cancer in this model. So what is the evidence in patients? Um, there are very strong data for showing dysbiosis in cirrhosis, which is a precancerous condition, as 90% of HCCs develop in patients with cirrhosis, and HCC is the main cause of death in patients with compensated cirrhosis. And here is a comparison of cirrhosis with multiple diseases, not of the liver, but other diseases, such as colorectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, showing the most profound fibrosis in cirrhosis. And multiple studies have shown very strong uh, dysbiosis in cirrhosis, which can also be leveraged as a diagnostic tool. So how about dysbiosis in HCC? This is a study I'm showing you here, comparing a NAFLD into uh, cirrhosis patients with and without HCC to each other, as well as to healthy controls. And 
the author showed a strong uh, reduction in diversity between the healthy and the cirrhotic patients here, but there was no difference between cirrhosis with and without HCC. Same similar data in the PCA plot here. However, taking a closer look at the genus level, the authors could see differences between cirrhosis with and without HCC. And they could also associate specific changes such as increased vector voides and decreased bifidobacteria and acromancia um, to changes in cytokine levels, uh, inflammation, and immunity. One additional study here uh, comparing uh, early HCC to liver cirrhosis and control. Um, and they couldn't really show consistent changes, no, um, um, at least in terms of the HCC. So there was a decrease in, in richness between um, the cirrhosis and compared to the control patients, but there was no um, a decrease, but even an increase in the early HCC. However, again, taking a closer look, the authors saw, saw differences between cirrhosis and early HCC at the phylum and genus level. Here, the phylum level comparing cirrhosis to early HCC and control to early HCC. And um, here at the genus level, the differences. Here, the authors could also um, use a microbial signature to differentiate between HCC and non-HCC. A number of additional studies also show changes here. One study showing an increase of E. coli in patients with HCC. A study comparing cirrhosis to HCC of mixed etiology, found moderate microbial changes again. Um, a study showing um, HCC um, of HBV and non-HBV, non-HBV origin, showing differences between those groups in terms of the microbiome, again, moderate. And another study on nephrogy cirrhosis and nephrogy HCC showing moderate changes in the microbiota. So overall, the differences between HCC and cirrhosis seem small to moderate, and they're not always consistent between all the studies, and much smaller than the differences between normal and cirrhosis patients, again, keeping in mind that cirrhosis is a precancerous condition and could affect hepatic carcinogenesis. The functional relevance of these changes in um, patients with HCC seem unclear, and they need further investigations in people. A new uh, additional topic I would like to introduce is intertumoral bacteria, which have been shown in a number of tumors, not only colorectal and gastric cancer, but additional tumors such as breast and pancreatic cancer. And there is uh, increasing evidence for a role of intertumoral bacteria in HCC, a study profiling tumor-associated microbiota in HCC here, and another study showing a role of the liver microbiome, not specific in the tumors, uh, being implicated in cancer prognosis in HCC. So this is an evolving topic and we need further studies to characterize the intratumoral microbiome as well as the liver microbiome in HCC. The question arises whether these are live and proliferating bacteria or just bacterial remnants and their role versus that of the intestinal microbiome to be further investigated. In the second part, I wanna talk about pathways. I'm gonna keep this rather short. Um, as there are multiple reviews and also a number of uh, original papers on, on this topic. So the main driver is the dysbiosis as well as the increased translocation. Um, dysbiosis driving some of this. There's bacterial overgrowth also in the upper GI tract and there are altered metabolites, um, bacterial metabolites that can also reach uh, the liver. And altogether, this uh, changes inflammation, metabolism, proliferation, fibrosis, and immunity in the liver, which can set the stage to uh, liver cancer development. This is a slide taken from a recent review that I wrote together with Tim Grayton, showing a role of the leaky gut and dysbiosis, um, again, which are connected to each other. Uh, the leaky gut uh, inducing the release of or translocation of microbe-associated molecular patterns, NAMs are often also called PAMs, 
uh, which activate pattern recognition receptors such as toll-like receptors on the various cells in the liver, which include uh, stellate cells and macrophages driving inflammation, fibrosis, the senescence associated secretory phenotype and the release of um, uh, mitogens such as epiregulin, which can drive hepatocyte proliferation. A recent paper also showing a role for TLR4 and hepatocytes driving the activation of stellate cells and fibrosis. So altogether, these can create an environment which is more prone to for the development of HCC. Dysbiosis and bacterial metabolite can additionally change this environment. Metabolites such as uh, secondary uh, uh, bile acids uh, acting on stellate cells, L6 and other cells, also influencing hepatic immune responses. Metabolites such as TMA, um, which is also acting on and metabolized by hepatocytes, turning, turning it into TMO, affecting the environment as well as ethanol, which can be produced by bacteria. Um, and as mentioned before, um, uh, bacteria metabolites um, can um, be uh, converted to short-chain fatty acids. And, and also these diets in dysbiotic mice that are high in soluble fibers and these bile acids together with these metabolites can then drive the development of In the third part of my talk, I want to focus on the microbiome as a therapeutic target in liver cancer, and first talk about cancer prevention. As mentioned before, there's chronic dysbiosis over a long time in different stages of the disease. And so we could target the gut liver access at different you know, stages and time points. However, I would argue that targeting in these early stages, we needed to, to treat a lot of patients to uh, prevent uh, development of liver cancer, so it probably makes sense to consider this targeting on the late stages of this disease. Related to this, I would like to show you again some data from our cancer cell paper, where we used non-absorbable antibiotics and treated mice at early and late stages. And to our surprise, at early stages, we only saw a moderate reduction of cancer development Whereas when we treated the mice late in the second half, we saw a profound reduction of cancer development also seen here by various mm -hmm. uh, parameters. So this indicates that antibiotics could help to prevent or delay HCC development in patients with advanced liver disease. How could this be achieved? There are multiple approaches. Dysbiosis could be alleviated by probiotics, and there, there are a number of studies that show positive data, but there's not really agreement on which antibiotic would be, uh, sorry, which probiotic would be the most appropriate. Antibiotics, especially uh, non absorbable antibiotic rifaximin, which has used a lot, has been used a lot in patients with cirrhosis and has a good safety profile, could be used to. Uh, re reduce leaky gut and target specific bacteria in the gut, prokinetics as well as agents improving the gut barrier such as FXR agonists could also improve this. TLR antagonists could block TLR induced signals that promote uh, uh, tumors or tumor promoting reactions such as inflammation, fibrosis, proliferation, and anti-apoptosis. However, um, long-term use is problematic, especially because of systemic immunosuppression in these patients which are already immunosuppressed and these drugs are not currently not FDA approved. And in, in theory, it's also conceivable to directly target bacterial metabolism. Um, so metabolites that promote cancer could be inhibited. How can this, this be realized in patients? Or one could consider primary as well as secondary HCC prevention. Uh, in my opinion, it would be important to identify high-risk patients. Um, there are a number of ongoing clinical trials using some of these um, drugs that I mentioned before. However, rifaximin, norfloxacin, and FXR agonist, although they're given to patients with cirrhosis, um, the trials do not list uh, HCCS either primary or secondary outcome. And there's only one 
uh, study we're using probiotics. So overall, this is something that hasn't been realized in patients yet. Finally, I want to talk a couple of minutes about the microbiome in cancer treatment. There's very exciting and accumulating data that um, the microbiome promotes anti-tumor or regulates anti-tumor therapy in mice. Um, so studies showing effects on chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Um, basically, what's been shown that antibiotics treated and germ-free mice have reduced effects of chemotherapy and um, immunotherapy. And soon after these mouse studies, there have been also um, studies in patients, and this is a rapidly expanding area, just showing these three landmark papers that were co-published in Science, all showing a role of the gut microbiome in immunotherapy in different tumors. And this one example for one um, uh, study here showing that patients uh, taking antibiotics have worse prognosis, patients with non-small cell lung cancer, as well as patients with immune responses against specific commensals also have uh, these responses affect survival. So overall, there's strong data in mice and patients that the bacterial microbiota controls the tone of the immune system and increases anti-tumor responses. Finally, I also want to point out a new area of development, which is engineered bacteria as a therapy for cancer. This is a study here from Science and Station Medicine showing that bacteria can be used as a vehicle for therapy because they are strongly enriched in tumors versus other tissue, the liver here, not showing bacteria where these uh, fluorescent bacteria are strongly seen within the tumors. And a second study showing this also published in Nature Medicine, where they used uh, bacteria that expressed a CD47 nan nanobody. All the bacteria, again, uh, were strongly enriched in tumors versus liver or spleen. And the, um, to, the bacteria that expressed the nanobody against CD47 achieved a strongly increased survival in, in mice uh, there in tumors. So I want to summarize um, and answer some two questions um, on this topic. Does the microbiome have a role in autocarcinogenesis? So there's strong data in mice with multiple studies. In patients, the changes in HCC versus cirrhosis seem moderate, whereas there are strong changes in cirrhosis versus normal. And again, cirrhosis is a precancerous condition that can drive um, you know, cancer development in the liver. Um, a clear functional link in human HCC is still missing. And the role of the intertumoral microbiome as well as the microbiome in further investigation. Are there specific bacteria that promote HCC? There are no clear candidates as opposed to CRC, colorectal cancer. It seems rather that dysbiosis and the leaky gut um, drive this development. Is a microbiome a target for HCC prevention? Studies in mice suggest this, but this needs to be um, uh, investigated in clinical trials. And finally, is the microbiome a target for HCC treatment? Um, there are promising approaches combining the gut microbiome modulation, such as FMT, together with checkpoint inhibitors. This is mostly in non-HCC studies. Uh, in HCC, we first need to investigate whether microbial profiles correlate with the success of immunotherapy. And finally, engineered bacteria that grow specifically in tumors provide a new exciting opportunity for therapy, but this has only been done in mice so far. I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Robert, for an outstanding uh, presentation as always. We'll wait for a few minutes to take all the questions. Uh, in the discussion, and I have the distinct pleasure now to invite Professor Suk from Korea, from the Halim University College of Medicine. He is a professor in internal medicine also uh, of the head of Microbiome Center and Institute for Liver and Digestive Diseases. And I had the pleasure of working with him for a short time. Uh, so he will be presenting a case uh, 
Dr. Sukh, I hope it is not very difficult for us. All right, please go ahead. Thank you for your introduction. I'm Ki Tae Sook from Korea. In this presentation, I will summarize the previous presentations. I will present by this order alcohol liver disease, non-alcohol fat liver disease, hepatocarcinogenesis, and targeting the gut microbiota. Liver disease is a clinical spectrum of disease that includes fat liver, hepatitis, liver cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma. Most common etiologies are virus, alcohol, fatty change, and gut microbiota. In case of hepatitis, 7% of patients show the mortality rate during 15-year follow. Regarding liver cirrhosis, 5-year survival rates are very low. Human gut microbiota is a complex ecosystem consists of more than 2,000 species and more than 1 kg. Various factors such as lifestyle, genotype, physiology, and host immune system affect to microbial variation. Alcohol abuse causes intestinal dysbiosis and bacterial overgrowth. Certain gut bacteria can metabolize tryptophan into indole compounds that activate the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Activated aryl hydrocarbon receptor induces the expression of interleukin-22 in lamina propylia immune cells, which stimulates mucosal defense via the production of antimicrobial peptides, such as leg 3 beta and leg 3 gamma. Intestinal deficiency of leg 3 beta and leg 3 gamma increases bacterial translocation through the pleural vein. In the river, viable bacterial and microbial products induces hepatic inflammation, hepatocyte death, and fibrotic responses. In the non-alcoholic fat liver disease, gut-derived palms go to the river through the pleural vein and recognized by toll-like receptor. The activation of toll-like receptor results in steatosis, cell death, inflammation, and fibrosis. In non-alcoholic fat liver disease, insulin resistance, macrophage recruitment, and adipocyte dysfunction can be modulated by the intestinal-derived bilirubin, LPS, and glucagon-like peptide 1. This biosis and a leaky gut result in increased hepatic exposure to bacterial metabolites and mumps. Bacterial metabolites such as viruses author LSEC and CXCL16 dependent on NKT cell recruitment as well as hepatic sterile cell SASP. The contribution of bacterial metabolites TMA, TMAO, and ethanol to hepatocarcinogenesis is not yet understood. Bacterial mumps such as toll-like receptor 4 against LPS and toll-like receptor 2 against LTA act on hepatic sterile cell to promote hepatic sterile cell SASP and the secretion of hepatomitogen epilegulin. Mumps may act on the macrophage to trigger tumor-promoting inflammation as well as hepatic sterile cell activation and fibrosis, which may promote hepatic sterile cell development. We cannot change our genome, however, we can change our microbiome. We can use FMT, probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotics, and engineered bacteria for the treatment of liver disease. We can use paid therapy, antibiotic therapy, and antifungal agent for the modulation of the microbiome. FXR agonist and FGF-19 analog can be used for the treatment of liver disease. Regarding FMT, we did FMT for the decolonization of carbapenemase, producing carbapenemase resistant to enterobacteria. We did colonoscope and we used the produce tool. In the result, decolonization rate within one month is roughly 45%. Decolonization rate within the three months, roughly 75%. And six months' decolonization rate is 100%. Conclusion, in the liver disease, gut microbiome played a central role in the pathogenesis. Modulation of microbiome might be effective in the treatment of liver disease by regulating gut liver axis. Thank you.
thank you, this doctor. Uh, this is enough. Um, there's a lot of presentations that were done today. Very nice presentations, and thank you for this. And now it's time for discussion. Uh, Dr. Schnabel, we welcome you despite this very early hour in California. It's 5.40 a.m. there. Um, <clears throat> so Rob, Robert Schwabe and I are still waking up. It's still 8.41 hour time. But um, thank you everyone for this wonderful discussion. And please to the audience, uh, put your questions in the chat. Uh, Bern, there were some questions for you in your response to your excellent talk. Uh, Dr. Varma said, in your opinion, what is the best strategy for improving gut wall integrity in patients with alcohol-associated hepatitis? Um, thank you so much. Um, I think the jury is out. Um, and, um, you know, there's certainly in, in patients um, very good approaches with, you know, you can use non-targeted approaches like with probiotics. I think the overall response from probiotics are very good. The only problem with the clinical trials is that none of the clinical trial has, trials has been reproduced. So I think this is something that we need, we need to pay attention to, you know, to clearly reproduce the same clinical trial with the same probiotics, with the same regimen, with the same um, length of time, length of treatment, to see if all of these results are, are um, or reproducible. So probiotics are probably one of the, um, you know, treatment options that could be used in the future to um, treat uh, patients with alcohol-associated liver disease. Now the new, the more um, newer advanced techniques, like really, um, where you have this precision medicine approaches, they are really in the um, in the preclinical stages at this point. We can't really make any judgments. What, uh, how this will affect our patients eventually. Thanks for that answer. Um, anyone from the panelists want to comment as well? Dr. Sareen, Dr. Shastri, Dr. Yang. Yeah, may, I, may I ask uh, for Mr. you? Yes, uh, probiotics. Um, uh, so what, what, are, what type of pro probiotics are we talking about and what would be the dosage? Uh, does it uh, matter? And uh, what do you think? Because we have a lot of probiotics on over the counter. And people talk about this and uh, just don't really understand whether there is any uh, suggestions on what to be used and how much. I don't know about Burns experience, but at least uh, we do not use probiotics for treatment, at least. We do it as part of research trials, et cetera, in patients at this stage, because um, as you currently pointed out, unless it's a pharmaceutical grade, we don't know what's actually in them. And there are certain analyses that have been done, at least in patients with pancreatitis, that probiotics in critically ill patients could actually promote higher death because, and it's because of the critical illness, nothing to do with the underlying liver disease itself. Um, and, but therefore, I think, especially with alcohol-related hepatitis, the, you know, the antibiotics, et cetera, and a whole lot of other things, you really want to be very careful what you're putting into that patient. Uh, we don't use it as part of a research study, but this is important to know that these, those are the one a few methods in which you can positively potentially modulate the gut microbiome. Yeah. Um, Charles, I completely agree. I mean, um, I might have um, phrased this in a way that this is clinical practice. The question I answered was how can we um, stabilize the gut microbiota and how can we stabilize the gut barrier? So in, in this case, one of the options is um, probiotics. I completely agree with Charles that they, we are far away from using this routinely in the in clinical practice. And um, so, so more clinical trials, as I said, you know, are needed to, um, to confirm the beneficial overall trial, um, the, 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 the Real good beneficial uh, clinical outcome in these clinical trials. We will hear a very nice um, um, presentation at ASLD about this yeah. in alcohol associated hepatitis. Yeah, yes, because the problem is uh, there is a lot of uh, commercially available so over the counters, and there is a lot of um, different brands and claimings. And I think that uh, once uh, the, the terms pro probiotics comes out from a very good scientists like you, then uh, the, the public might be misled because there is no actually 
uh, uh, a brain for the probiotics. And I think sometimes uh, uh, as a responsible uh, professional body, so we might need to clarify these issues because I always encounter patients coming with bottles of probiotics uh, from US, Canada, whatever, China. And this is sometimes very difficult, especially then they link the two things together and we are far from that. Hey, Dr. Lau, this is an amazing question that you actually raised because uh, there is a uh, clinical practice is very, very different now. And especially when you talk about traditional medicines in India, as well as China and other places, they have such a huge impact on liver health, uh, or at least perceived benefit versus not lack of benefit. So I, yeah, I think our uh, message is consistent that, you know, right now, more trials are needed um, and continue current management for East Alpha and associated hepatitis. Uh, there are Dr. Sareen, Dr. Shastri, any of our uh, Korean colleagues, any comments on this important On this, uh, uh, thank you. I would like to say that uh, for alcoholic hepatitis, we, are, we finished one trial, what Dr. Shastri showed, where steroid eligible versus uh, FMT was tried, and uh, we had reasonably good response. In fact, a shade better than what we had with uh, uh, steroids. And the way it was that every patient, the donor was screened very carefully for entropathogenic and all those, I mean, the complete protocol and was on a standard diet. And the patients were followed up carefully. But I agree with you, it is still part of a clinical trial and a senior resident has to be on watch all the time. You can't give it to everyone. Uh, therefore, I would say there is a promise it can be tried and we use the naso uh, duodenal route rather than the other route. So in naso duodenal, we feel that a small amount uh, can regurgitate back into the stomach. So we have to be extra careful in that. But with that, uh, this is a protocol that is being done at our place uh, regularly. We would have done 200 plus patients, but a lot more needs to be learned. As far as the integrity of the bowel is concerned, so all the mate cells related studies, including uh, zona occludens and others were done. I don't remember them well, but it did change the mate cells. Uh, so what we used to do was to take an biopsy if the patient did not have coagulopathy while the jejunal, uh, nasojejunal tube was placed. And we were able to see if there was a change in the circulating uh, and other made cell markers. But the field is in infancy and we have to be doubly cautious. Thank you. Another nice question by Dr. Pratibha Kale. Uh, Candida species are also commensal microbiota. Is there any other species than albicans associated with alcohol-related liver disease? Question is for burnt and after burnt, everyone can answer. Um, we have seen, and we have published this, um, there are other species and we are currently working on them. Um, so the jury is out, it's, it's probably, um, Canada is from a proportional perspective, but also from a absolute abundance perspective, probably the most dominant um, uh, microbial or the fungi species that takes over in patients with alcohol associated liver disease. There are less abundant fungi that are also increasing. And um, um, like I said, we have very early data, so I can't, uh, preclinical data, so we, I, I can't really say if it's, um, if it's, you know, associated with worse outcome in preclinical models, but yes, there are um, there are there, there, there are potentially other um, fungi that promote alcohol associated liver disease, and then you have, you also have the questions, and that's certainly something we have to also consider. You know, are there fungi, are there beneficial fungi, right? that are decreased during alcohol associated liver disease, not even, not only alcohol associated liver disease, but for example, nephrity and NASH um, that are decreased during chronic liver disease and might, that might and this decrease of this beneficial um, fungi might also contribute to disease. So that's also something, you know, that should be looked at. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, and in patients with cirrhosis, again, we find an expansion of candida in patients and with with and without antibiotics. But with antibiotics, the fungal diversity collapses and the antibiotic and the candida takes over. So I think it's a resident. Uh, uh, it, it, it like any bug, it can be a commensal under the right circumstances, but under when it takes over, it potentially could cause an issue. And especially since we realize that the uh, of the fungal infections, the number one cause was candida also in patients with cirrhosis. Of course, it was not the same people that we took the ITS sequencing and did the infections off. When that actually, that quote unquote overgrowth or high abundance becomes, translates into an actual infection, like the bacteria is a balance between local immunity, systemic immunity, and the virulence of the, the microbiota, the microbiota uh, itself. So yeah, clearly, uh, any other uh, comments, uh, Dr. Sareen, Robert, uh, Shole, Dr. Uh, Dr. Cho? Can't fail, no. You know, I, I, I want to just make the uh, one comment that the, um, on the previous question about the uh, gut wall integrity in alcoholic uh, AH patients. Uh, Dr. Lau mentions the number of the probiotics. Uh, we cannot really, many, many patients cannot really uh, determine that. And I think the most probiotics is currently available is mostly, uh, we call the grass in Korea uh, and the, the lactose or bifidos. But the uh, gut microbiome has a huge, uh, very different diversity species. So I, we, our lab published uh, last year or two years ago about one of the uh, gum microbiota called the rosberia uh, is the it's uh, the flagellin of the rosberias uh, increase the uh, gut uh, tightness, uh, increasing zone one, <clears throat> so particularly the, the proteins, and the uh, through the TR5 the uh, the receptors. Uh, we uh, I, I'd like to let you know that the, we are currently uh, doing some clinical trial in the uh, three hospitals in Korea. So. Uh, it's, I think, very early stage uh, right now. So I think as the science advanced, maybe a number of different options or either the uh, gum microbes or the particular uh, cellular component or the uh, metabolite may be uh, used as a treatment to, the, uh, to increase the, uh, the gut uh, tightness. Uh, thank you very much. Can I ask? Ask uh, the moderator one question and then one to the panelists. Moderate. I wanted to ask uh, moderator. To... Well, I thought I was clean, free. <laughs> <My Yeah. one>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe, maybe uh, everyone can guide. And the question is: You have an alcoholic hepatitis. You give steroids, and you do Lil score at day seven because you think the response to steroids and J in the inflammatory markers would come in seven days time. However, when you give newer therapies like Anakindra or maybe FMT, FMT is given at least by us for seven days. So a little score at seven days is unlikely to change. And we know that the engraftment or establishment of the flora uh, takes at least uh, whatever little studies we have takes three to four weeks time before they struggle to settle down and make some impact. So I have two questions to maybe Jess and uh, Burned and others. First, uh, in a patient who has alcoholic hepatitis, how much time do you think it takes for the bacteria to get engrafted or established? And two, uh, should we not change from LIL to another scoring system? where we assess maybe at four weeks or after that, or like Delta meld or a new score, like these are the two questions, yes. Okay, very important questions. And it tells you that, you know, as things change, as life changes, as what you are introducing new therapies, we want to move, move with the time. And, I, and LIL is actually more a score of futility rather than a score of prognosis itself. It's like, stop the steroids if this doesn't happen. And it is interlinked with the steroid therapy. And if you are doing something that is in addition to steroid therapy or in patients like you had published before who were not eligible for steroid therapy, 
then it really is a prognostic thing, but it's not an absolute thing. To me, uh, depending on different studies, the engraftment rates are so different. And as you know, even in Clostridium difficile, Clostridioides difficile, where there is the most uh, reports, you don't need to have full engraftment for the patient to actually feel better, get better, get adequate outcomes. So as long as we stick to an outcome that everyone agrees, death, worsening of liver disease, et cetera, I think we'd be okay. When we talk about engraftment, even in FMT, as I said, in places where anybody's FMT will be better, like in C. difficile, all you need is a person who does not have FMT, doesn't have C. diff. If you put their stool, the patient will more than 95% get better provided nothing else has happened. Even in those patients where there's a clear cut improvement within days, the engraftment is either not there or it's not completely there. But the clear thing is the uh, what we want to talk about here is not to be too invested in the engraftment part leading to this. We want to go and make sure that we are doing our best. Like your protocol for seven days, these are very sick patients. You want to give them the best and give them not one enema and then forget about it like we had done in an outpatient. Outpatient is a completely different ball game. This person, you need to hit them and hit them hard if, you, if things need to be changed. And I'm, I, I, I agree with you that if your treatment lasts for seven days, you cannot use a clinical scoring system um, that reads out in seven days. That was actually uh, related to steroid therapy, which has nothing to do with what you're doing. So it's not like that system is wrong. It's just that it may not be applicable to the greatest extent here. And you may want to also focus on things such as bile acid change profile, because we have found that, um, and, and the situation is like in alcohol and hepatitis is very different and burnt, please comment. Uh, but the people who have uh, restoration of their secondary bile acid producing capability in cirrhosis are the ones in whom the FMT sticks and it works. And in ones who don't, they don't. Uh, we had published this from JCI inside with the oral capsules. But again, uh, this is a very fraught topic and very important topic because these patients are so sick. Any comments burned on this? No, I, I, I agree with Charles. I think we are a little bit far away, you know, to really, do, to really know what is the, what is, and this was Charles mentioned, you know, whom is, what is the real best readout for eventually who is getting better, why is that patient getting better? So in other words, you know, if we go towards this, you know, what we always say, you know, where this precision medicine approach, right? So looking at metabolites, looking at other um, factors that improve in the patient, that improve with the engraftment, and then link this to the, um, to the, um, to, to the uh, you know, FMT and to the patient, for example, short chain fatty acid, for example, like um, Dr. Bashash mentioned, you know, um, bile acids, would this be the better follow-up markers, biomarkers for getting, um, or potentially even, you know, markers for, um, for improvement. So causing causality in terms of improving liver disease, would they, these be the better markers than only looking at like in Kraftman? So I think, for, you know, the more we learn in the future, I think the more precise we can get, and then we can use like from away from FMTs, you know, this is future, obviously, um, more to, for example, bioengineered bacteria, synthetic bacteria, like postbiotics, like metabolites that we know um, might be sufficient to do this, if, if it's feasible, or maybe a combination out of many of these um, factors. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I have a brief question to Dr. Ko, and maybe after that, Robert uh, can address that. Uh, do you think the, and it's, it may look stupid as a question, do you think the change in bacterial flora in NAFLD is a result of hepatic disorder or is the cause of hepatic disorder? And how do you address this question? Every day people keep asking the cause and effect. And the same will be true, maybe Robert can address, is the development of carcinogenesis uh, in the liver. Uh, is it bidirectional or unidirectional? 
Yes, um, I think that's the, uh, uh, the very important and and questions and also uh, I think that every time we uh, do the uh, solve the, the the patients the data is this the correlation of causalities and or using the different types of models including uh, cell or jump freeze or conventional mice we try to demonstrate the uh, the causality of the particular the uh, microbes. I think this biosis is very uh, the vague terms. When uh, as a microbiologist, see this biosis is more like a, in terms of ecologies. But I believe one of among these this biosis, I think I believe that particular the uh, the strains of the microorganisms or the particular the molecules of microorganism or metabolism microorganism is the uh, responsible for these uh, uh, some of the pathogenesis. Uh, so I believe the, we try to identify that and then uh, demonstrate in the, uh, the causality using uh, the my animal models and so on. So uh, from my talk, I leverage these models. We initially, we try to identify the number of different markers and actually I show one of the isolate, but we screen over the hundred, the microbes trying to identify the particular the strains of microbes to uh, to demonstrate the causality of the elevation of the, uh, the nephrodine models in, in mice model in this case. And so uh, I think we need to uh, look at uh, very closely that, but uh, man, I believe the many studies uh, the, the report the causalities of the particular strains or molecular mechanisms. So uh, that's what we are looking for. Yeah, so if, if I can quickly comment from my perspective, yes, it's, it's a two-way bidirectional relationship. And obviously in HCC, there seems to be a component driving this. The intratumoral microbiome that I have briefly mentioned is something that we really don't understand very well, especially in HCC, there need to be more studies. But overall, I think the biggest gap that, that in, you know, in the area of HCC is really the understanding of you know, therapeutic responses. And I think melanoma is really driving this. I mean, like with the immunotherapy, the HCC field is following. So we really have to understand uh, much better um, what you know, the role of the microbiota is in dictating therapeutic responses. And this may be a really uh, important area that could be uh, modified. As I mentioned already, also I think that the uh, you know, engineered bacteria as a ther therapeutic vehicle uh, is something obviously that's very far away from the clinic, but you know, the mouse studies are extremely exciting. So, you know, I for the HCC field, which is different from cirrhosis, I think we need to shift our attention a little bit. Yeah, if uh, we can comment here, uh, like in severe alcoholic hepatitis, alcoholic hepatitis, uh, like there must be some trigger from the gut. It is the gut which is causing the alcoholic hepatitis. A person who is been drinking for a long time suddenly develops an hepatitis or alcoholic hepatitis flare. So he's been drinking and he's been eating same forever. So what is the trigger for the onset of alcoholic hepatitis? Can it be gut microbiome or any particular change in the uh, microbiome? I think you have a point, uh, Dr. Shastri, and uh, the, the issue is wide open, but in the interest of time, we have two questions. One, I'll come back to you, and one to Bernd, who, uh, Robert, maybe how do you use cytolysin? And what dosage? One of the questions there is, how, do, how can we dose the cytolysin? Or anyone um, else in the panel? I think this is in response. Yeah, at the yeah. point, this was in response. Oh, to no, sorry, you had to be, should send the cytolysin thing. I think that the, the attendee was not uh, clear as to what you meant by the cytolysin. Yeah, just... yeah, so so um, so cytolysin seems to be, first of all, you know, a very, very good biomarker for disease outcome in patients with alcohol-associated hepatitis. So with alcoholic hepatitis, 
um, in, this was based on a qPCR test from um, patients where we took the stool and essentially did the uh, qPCR for the two subunits um, in the in the you know in the stool from these patients for the cytolysin. Um, so so we would we would propose that this is a and probably very specific good biomarker for alcoholic hepatitis rather than any other disease, at least in our hands. And obviously this needs to be confirmed by other groups, by other um, studies um, who, who repeat this. So this is the first part, very good biomarker seems to be the case. And then um, for treatment, you know, we are far away, but um, it, it, we are, um, it certainly can be uh, proposed to use a clinical trial targeting these bacteria that make the cytolysin with, um, for example, bacteriophages. I can also en envision, you know, other antibiotics that could um, eradicate these bacteria. The problem with Enterococcus faecalis is, and we know this from our whole genome sequencing, is that you have many, many, many antibiotic resistance genes in this box. So that, that might be a, a step which we have to overcome if you want to treat these patients with um, antibiotics. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think the time that we had is too short for such a big and hot topic. Yes. May I ask uh, Jess uh, to kindly give some more comments uh, before I conclude? Jess, your wisdom and your wise comments. Oh my God. Okay. Thank you so much uh, to Apazel and thank you for this wonderful panel of speakers and my distinguished co moderator and the president of Apazel. Uh, this is the who's who of Apazel is represented here and who's who of uh, World Microbiota Research and Liver Disease is represented here. I think there was an excellent talk, even though many talks uh, that we concluded are not ready for prime time yet, it still gives us a lot of food for thought, not just to us, but to the more than 100 attendees that were here and were actively participating and listening. And I think this is something that Apazel should think about much more carefully and maybe do it two hours next time <laughs> so that uh, we have a lot more interaction and a lot more junior investigators involved in you know presenting cases and uh, already into the program. So it, it's a good problem to have. There is too much to be done and actually things to have rather than sitting and no one interacting. Well, thank you so much for your time. I have to run to clinic. Uh, okay. Take care. Thank you, Jess. And, uh... I would like to thank our president, uh, Professor Jin Mo Yang, and the whole Korean group, and Dr. Suk, uh, particularly, who is a pillar in Korea in the microbiome area. But uh, we could not discuss more. And I do say that these are very young people, including Dr. Shastri, Dr. Suk, Dr. Ko, and of course, uh, you, Jess. Uh, thank you all. and. Uh, uh, I would like to say that this is one of the sessions and I hope the annual meeting which is going to be held in Korea would have a full day or longer time for this. Koreans have extremely high standards of microbial research, so we will have more of them. But the Apostle as, pers as one of the representatives from Apostle, I would like to thank you. Thank our other panelists. Uh, are there any other comments from our panelists? Sorry, I didn't ask uh, Professor Yoko Sukha, Professor Kanda. Uh, sorry, any other comments before I conclude, Dr. Kanda? Dr. Yoko Sukha? Yeah, I enjoyed this, um, you know, uh, uh, meeting very much. And uh, I think um, we have to think about the um, risk of uh, using the phrases or such sort of things. But um, uh, anyway, I enjoyed this meeting. Thank you very much. Dr. Kanda? I also enjoyed uh, this meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. George? It's wonderful meeting. Especially now we are going to immunotherapy for hepatocellular carcinoma. There is a lot to understand. Yes. And congratulations to the work of the Koreans and all the speakers and moderators. And Professor Lim. 
Well, thank you very much, Professor Sarin and all the speakers and the chairpersons for uh, making this uh, webinar to be wonderful. Thank you very much again. You and Professor Jin Moyang are the pillars for this webinars, and we thank you and your uh, team. And with that, I would like to say profuse thanks to all our speakers, for especially for getting up in the early morning and being with us. Uh, it's a huge effort and a puzzle, and all of us uh, deeply appreciate. And we hope to be together in the near future. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.